So hello, welcome everyone uh, to this uh, event uh, from the Chatham House Europe program uh, discussing our new paper on the economic basis of democracy. Uh, I'm Pepin Bergs, I'm a research fellow in the Europe program at Chatham House. I'll be moderating today's discussion. So here at Chatham House, or there at Chatham House, I'm speaking to you from my home, um, and specifically the Europe program, we're doing quite a lot of work on democracy, ranging from diving into the functioning of representative institutions to taking sort of a step back and exploring broader threats to democracy in Europe. And that's what we want to talk about today. Um, for this work, we wanted to go beyond the standard debates on sort of cultural versus economic explanations for the rise of populist forces in Europe and explore more broadly the relationship between the economy and democracy. We thought that was not just important to understand how we got to where we are, but also uh, crucial to understand how previous economic and political transformations have contributed to the current political backlash in order to avoid any subsequent backlash as we reorder our ec uh, economies during the green economic transition, for instance. So I'm really proud uh, of the paper that came out of this work, um, a link to which should be you should be able to find in the chat at some point. And I'm very happy uh, that all of my co-authors are here today. And I'll introduce them to you very soon. But first, I want to thank Professor Kasmude uh, for joining us today to respond to the paper and give us his thoughts on this topic. So he's the Stanley Wade Shelton Professor of International Affairs at the University of Georgia. But more importantly, he's also one of the leading voices um, on populism and the far right in the world. So as I said, we're also joined by uh, my co-authors on this report, uh, Leah Downey, Marx Krahe, Manuela Moschella, Quinn Sobodian, and Hans Kunnani. And since this is a uh, Chatham House event, um, I feel I need to point out that this event is not under the Chatham House rule. So feel free to discuss both what you heard and gossip about who actually said it. A uh, recording of the event uh, will be um, available on the Chatham House website um, sometime soon. So the format of today's discussion will be quite simple. Um, after I have joined on for slightly too long, I'll hand over the floor to Cass to respond to the paper and uh, some of the authors will then respond to that. Um, and after that, we will start our Q&A. So please be ready to put your questions and comments uh, masquerading as questions in the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your screen uh, so I can put them to the panelists. Um, we won't be able to monitor the chat uh, for questions. So we have quite limited time, but I would like to give you a very quick run through first of uh, the paper in the highly unlikely case that one or two people on the webinar that they haven't read it yet. Um, so as I mentioned, we first looked um, at a lot of the existing debate on the state of democracy in Europe, which often boils down to discussions of populism and in turn debates on whether this is caused by economic or by cultural factors. And we concluded from that there is a need to look beyond these debates and look at how democracy and politics interact with the changing structures of European economies and economic policy making. And so we think it's important to look at how policy is made and how politics functions because increased economic in inequality in recent decades, so broadly speaking, starting in the early 1980s, has contributed to political inequality as well. And this has made political systems a lot less responsive. And um, we think it's a trend, both the economic and political inequality um, that, we, um, that we've noted. And that, that has possibly fueled some of the backlash uh, that we're seeing. So a contributing factor to that reduction in democratic responsiveness is also the depoliticization of economic policy making. As much economic policy decision making was moved out of the area of democratic contestation and often into more technocratic modes of governance, the preferences of the groups most well represented were further entrenched, again, fueling um, the uh, political backlash. And on top of that, as democratic contestation over economic issues became to a large extent redundant, uh, because it was handled in this more technocratic way um, and in part because so much of the political mainstream converged on essentially the same economic ideas, politics has increasingly polarized around cultural questions, making it even less likely that the economic and political inequalities that we see as driving this dysfunction uh, will eventually be tackled. So we conclude from that that what we need is a repoliticization of economic, fiscal and monetary policy making in Europe in order to ensure that there are economic policy choices for political contestation to form around. Now, that's quite a lot easier said than done. Um, so we only really 
subtly hint uh, to a general direction uh, for doing this um, and are still looking um, for um, ways to move this forward. So hopefully we get a chance to talk about that today as well. But I'll stop talking now and um, hand over the floor to Cass, who will hopefully say uh, many nice things about the paper and maybe one or two uh, points that could have been slightly done better. Um, and with that, uh, over to you, Cass. Thank you, Pepijn. And I mean, as Pepijn knows, you always go to Dutch people if you want to get compliments because um, that's our national culture, right? Um, I actually have compliments <clears throat> for this, but um, I think what is important to notice, I think the, the paper fits very well with, um, I would say, what mainstream comparative politics, comparative European politics is, is writing about at the moment. And so I'm actually teaching a transformation of European politics graduate course um, where I just, um, we just talked about Giddens, which is of course very important, the third way argument, and then about MOVE, about the democratic paradox, which is again, very central to this. And yesterday we talked about Peter Mayer, my late supervisor's ruling the void. I think particularly that book and his arguments there are very, very close to um, what is argue, argued here. And particularly Peter made this distinction between responsive politics and responsible politics. And the tension between that and to a certain extent as a consequence of Europeanization, neoliberalism, globalization, whatever you want to call it, this argument that responsive politics where parties do what their voters want has kind of disappeared because the pressures institutional on governing parties to be responsible, which generally means what the market believes should be done, like is so much bigger. Um, and I think that um, this is kind of central to, to most of what I at least find the more interesting thinking about, in particularly European politics. <clears throat> of course, it goes broader, although given that uh, quite a lot of this is also party politics, it's a bit harder to extend to the US specifically and Canada comes closer. So I think there are four key strengths of the report. First of all, it centers economic inequality which um, I personally find severely lacking in the European debate, particularly compared to at least the US American debate. I'm not very familiar with, with other parts of North America. Um, it also decenters populism, which I think is incredibly important. <clears throat> populism, first of all, is not as important as everyone makes it out to be. Um, most populist parties these days are actually radical right parties of which populism is a secondary issue. Nativism is the core. And you even see that some of the more successful radical right parties have, have kind of become much less populist, Sweden Democrats being a good example. Um, but also populism is just one of the responses to the broader process and not even necessarily the most problematic for democracy, if you particularly think about uh, a subgroup of the electorate, which is permanently um, dis disengaged from uh, the political process, right? And, and so <clears throat> I think we focus disproportionately on, in Hirschman's terms, voice, and far too little on exit. <clears throat> um, and in fact, in addition to exit, you of course have people who were never part of it. And particularly here in the US where significant parts of particularly African-American population actually never participated um, and are completely ignored in debates. Um, the call for repolitization, I think is crucial. Again, something that we see in the work of Move or of Mayor. And what I particularly like <clears throat> is that it rejects the sharp distinction between the US debate and the European debate. Um, and this argument that uh, a lot of the debates that we have had here in the US over the last couple of years are typical American, that they address issues that, that only the US has and that Europe doesn't have, things like institutional racism, right? <clears throat> so going to these points a bit more, I think that 
one of the really interesting things about the focus on economic inequality is the broader concept of it, like uh, going beyond wage and income and focusing on wealth. Now, I don't know too much about this in the European context, but for example, in the Great Recession, which was to a large extent a housing uh, bubble, like explosion, like here in the US, <clears throat> there was like a massive racial distinction in part because most African-Americans had all their wealth in the house, right? And so African-American wealth was almost swept away, whereas a lot of white people had their wealth in other things as well. And one of the things that we of course still see is how difficult it is or how unwilling most political parties are to, to tax wealth at similar levels as they, they tax income. Um, and in various countries of traditionally as well, like uh, we're, we're pretty high in maximizing income uh, and wage. <clears throat> and so it, it, it also just in, ter in, old, in terms of efficiency as well as fairness, like we, we, have, to, we have to move to, to taxing wealth. Um, I like that there is a, that the report goes beyond the artificial separation between the economic and the cultural, although I do believe that it can go further. Um, I think that um, <clears throat> coming to it from, let's say, a, a social democratic perspective, which, which I, I am an old school social democrat in that sense, I think that a lot of the European debate <clears throat> um, misses the point that a lot of what is called identity politics is actually fundamentally economic as well. Like if you think about Black Lives Matter, which is even like fundamentally anti-capitalist, you don't have to go that far. But the whole argument is that you cannot separate the two. Like that the economic inequality and cultural inequality are, are deeply connected. And if you don't have both, like you just don't have equality. Um, and this is something that's so sensitive from the right to the left, actually, right? But, and I, I still feel that we can do much more. Fully agree that populism is a symptom, not the cause. Um, I've called it myself in line, I think, with the report and the liberal democratic response to undemocratic liberalism. I think what is important is that we separate the message from the messenger. And so yesterday in my class, for example, one of my students said, but isn't Peter Mayer's own argument populist, right? And so if you think about Mayer's argument and this argument of cartelization, political parties working together to keep power, like becoming more and more similar. And it isn't fundamentally because it doesn't make similar assumptions, but a lot of the critique is the same. And I think we, we have always done that since the radical right came up, <clears throat> that we have not been able to separate the questions from the answers, right? But a lot of the questions were valid and remain valid. And the fact that the answers might be abhorrent or just fundamentally anti-liberal democratic doesn't mean that we should ignore the questions. Of course, we should address the questions from our own ideology, not from theirs, right? <clears throat> and that brings me to the repolitization. Um, report makes it very clear that this is first and foremost an institutional issue, right? That, that to a certain extent, we have to bring fundamental decisions about the economy and I think to a certain extent beyond that, back into the electoral agenda uh, arena, right? So back into, <clears throat> um, into policy. But at the same time, even if we would do that and remain in this kind of ideological consensus, which, which is uh, an almost anti-ideological consensus, right? Pragmatism is everything. And it's not just on the left, like, I mean, Papain and, and my prime minister, <clears throat> uh, Mark Rutte is all the time talking about how he doesn't have a vision. And if you have issues with the vision, you have to go to an eye doctor and things like that. Like, I mean, this type of anti 
ideological, there's not non-ideological, it's anti-ideological idea that we should just have pragmatic solutions. Like we've heard from Obama, right? We, we've heard from Biden, we've heard from a lot of centrist and center left and right politicians. And I think what is more fundamental to me than anything, because we're much further away of it, is a re-ideologization of politics. Um, <clears throat> to a certain extent, that is, I think that's one of the big strengths of the far right. They actually, <clears throat> they actually do still do ideology. It's, it's rudimentary, right? But it is pretty fundamental. Um, the center left hasn't done this for a while and we've all written about it like with, with uh, new labor, but actually the center right hasn't done it either and has been mostly winning on adapting, on adopting like radical right uh, issues, frames, et cetera. And so what we need, we need ideologies, <clears throat> but modern ones. We don't need the social democracy of the 1960s, 70s. We need a social democracy that can adapt to the realities of the 21st century. And the same applies for, for Christian democracy, liberalism, whatever it is. And um, I think it's particularly important because when things go well, you don't have to convince people. You don't have to convince people why they get more money, right? <clears throat> but in crisis, you have to explain why people have to suffer, why they get less, why they don't get more, whatever it is. You have to explain to them why, and that has to be an ideological story. Like a, a Tina argument of there is no alternative is not going to cut it. It's also most of the time not true. Right? I mean, even with the Tina, Tina is a, is a choice. Tina is a choice for the status quo, right? And therefore an ideological choice. Um, finally, on the US versus Europe debate, um, although to very various degrees, like all European countries are Americanized, <clears throat> the, the, the things that happen in the US, socially, economically, social, culturally, uh, have significant effects on most European countries. Sure, Britain is the most Americanized after that, probably the Netherlands and, and a country like, <clears throat> I don't know, like Spain, much less. But almost all the trends that we see in the US play out very, very, very extreme, play out to a certain extent in Europe. And so having this strict separation makes little sense. I, I strongly believe that, at the, that over the last decades, the most interesting <clears throat> and, and uh, lively progressive debates have actually been here in the United States. Um, they are more fundamental. Um, if, just think about the Green New Deal, for example. I'm not talking about the specific details. I'm just talking about the, the fundamental questions that are being addressed. Now, Many of these arguments are seen as, well, this is just the US, like Black Lives Matter, like institutional racism, just the US. And that's simply not true. At the same time, the Netherlands isn't the US, like right? the Netherlands has institutional racism, but it has a very different history and it plays out very differently than in the US. And so while I think European progressives in particular can learn a lot from the recent debates in the US, it's also important that we adapt them to our own context. And again, the context of the Netherlands is not the same context of Spain, right? Or of the Czech Republic. Um, and some questions are irrelevant to, to, to Europeans. Like, I mean, healthcare, for example, most of the debate that we have here, right? Is, is irrelevant, it has guns, uh, all kinds of other things that are uniquely American or very specifically American. But some fundamental debates, most notably, how do you, how do you structure solidarity in a multicultural um, society uh, to move from tolerance to inclusion? I think those are debates that are essential to Europe. And they have, as, again, strong, cultural, but also a strong economic element. And in that sense, like, I think this report does, does a great job and I hope that it will, it will get a, a follow-up um, 
because as you said, a lot of things are mentioned, um, but you also already indicate they're pretty difficult to implement. I don't see the catch-22 that much though. I think that has a lot to do simply of, of politicians finally leading again rather than following. Um, but it is a, a mentality change. It requires like a mentality change. That's me. Thank you very much. That was, uh, yeah, that was very comprehensive, very interesting. Um, and um, yeah, giving me quite a lot to think about. And I think all the others probably as well. Um, and already things that I would want to change or include in the, the follow-up uh, in or in any follow-up report. Uh, but I'll... Um, leave it to someone else to properly respond. Uh, Leah, would you like to say a few words? Sure. Um, I also just want to say thank you. That was that was fantastic uh, response. And there is nothing more satisfying than even if they don't agree with everything, hearing someone who knows the space so well, um, understanding what we were trying to do with the report. So that, that was really satisfying. Um, so thank you. I'll just build on a few things that you said, um, I think, because I thought they were really helpful. I think you're bringing the um, dis mayor's distinction in the responsive versus responsible politics was really helpful. And it struck me that it ties into your point as well about the connection between the US and the European debates. Um, you know, I think in the 2016 election, something that came out of that, right, that uh, I, I'm not sure the lesson has been fully learned yet, but that came out of that lesson was, you know, Hillary was saying to, to the country, I'm here to help you. And Trump was saying, I'm here to represent you. I'm here to speak for you. I'm here as you, right? And I think that that distinction, um, you know, tracks to some extent the mayor distinction that you brought out and, and has been a really powerful one, at least for me in thinking about these things going forward. So I think you're absolutely right about, about connecting those two things. Um, also on your point about, uh, I wanna emphasize a little bit too about the, the point about populism as kind of a secondary issue or a symptom um, and centering economic inequality and in particular um, sort of institutional issues. And I think that, you know, um, the way that populism is sometimes used in the, in the general press, right? Not by scholars who actually understand exactly what they're talking about, um, sort of misses that point uh, and misses what you were saying, which is it's not just about people being in power, right? That we disagree with or don't like, right? It's about sort of uh, something much more foundational than that. And what we tried to do in the report is point out these sort of threats to democracy or these issues, right? Unbearable inequality, economic and political, cultural clashes, anti-immigration sentiment, anti-elite sentiment, and sort of suggest that a lot of these things can emerge as a product of, and things that we often glom onto this word populism, right, can emerge as a product of sort of a lack of democratic control, right? And it's that lack of control um, that can also make populism appealing, right? Uh, and that I think goes to your point about separating the message and the messenger, um, which is essential. And I don't, I think that's something we didn't get into enough in the report that could be definitely highlighted going forward, right? Um, that, you know, the, the message that we've seen in the rise recently uh, of lacking sort of democratic power and democratic control should be taken quite seriously, even if we think the, the response that was offered was clearly not the right one, right? And what we're essentially trying to do in the report is say, here's another response that we could talk about, right? In repoliticizing institutions and focusing on structures. Um, and one that, you know, is much more in line with our democratic values. Um, because in, in a way that you use the language of separating the message and the messenger, we kind of emphasize this populism's ambivalent relationship with democracy, right? And sort of almost suggest that in a certain sense, we could see populism or the versions that we're seeing recently as a sort of perversion of a democratic impulse, right? People wanting to steer government, right? And when the democratic system that was designed to allow them to do just that isn't allowing them for that, right? Then they turn elsewhere and start, uh, that impulse starts coming out in other, in other sort of guises. Um, one thing we didn't talk about much yet that I might just toss out there for others to mention or to bring up in the Q&A is in the report, we suggest that a couple reasons for this kind of lack of democratic control and the sort of structural changes are hyperglobalization and technocracy, the rise of technocracy, um, which is, I think, 
to your point, definitely something that's ex experienced um, in Europe and the US and that that debate travels as well, for sure. Um, although obviously the EU adds a complicating factor, um, which maybe we can get into more in the in the Q&A. Um, and just 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 to sort of put a finer point on it uh, to end these, uh, I'm going to be very brief because I know I want to hear from other other authors. But I think the point that you made that that the we're trying that we're trying to argue here that this is first and foremost an institutional issue. Um, also, I would love to hear your thoughts on how you think that relates to your point about needing a change in ideology or an uh, sort of re-ideologization. I'm sorry, I don't remember the word you used. Um, because I think that we might think, right, that one, one thing we might think is uh, sort of, I'm analogizing this to a debate um, about deliberative democracy and the and the need for good deliberation in democracy. So I tend to think that that deliberation um, is be a benefit, right? And that could be and and could lead to better policies, but is not the sort of foundational shift that we need to see. But rather, if you focus on the distribution of democratic power and control and who's actually making decisions, that good deliberation comes out of that, right? So once people actually have the power to influence policy, then they're gonna be a lot more interested in figuring out what to do with that power and what the right thing to do is with that. So I wonder if at what you would think of the suggestion that, you know, focusing on these institutional issues and who actually has power to make choices could lead to the sort of, re-engagement and birth of more ideology and of the sort that you're trying to uh, suggest we need. Um, so I'll leave with that question and see if anyone else wants to uh, jump in and add something. Thank you. Yeah, there was quite a lot. I think, um, yeah, the re-ideologization versus re-politicization. Um, I think we're going to stick with re-politicization, even if I do agree with Casa's point on that, just because I can pronounce it. Um, Manuela, did you want to, to, to come in as well before we move back to, to Cass? Uh, yes, sure. Um, let me also start by thank you, Cass, very much for these very important points, uh, which were extremely fascinating to hear, right? As we were saying as others, it's always good when somebody reads uh, your own work and come up with such uh, excellent comments. Um, you know, I was struck very much by this idea of radio radio large Irradialization. <laughs> I cannot spell it out as an Italian, it's a very difficult word. Uh, but, uh, you know, in preparing for this meeting, uh, I was having a second look uh, at our report uh, and I was looking at it uh, and I was thinking at the overall message we are sending out here, right? And I was thinking that on the one end, we have a very reassuring message, and on the other end, we have a more discomforting one. And uh, the way I see it is that the reassuring message is exactly what Cass was saying, that we suggest that ultimately this is an institutional problem and we can fix it, probably not necessarily with our proposals, but there are thousands of proposals out there for how we can fix the problem in European political economy, European capitalism, and so on and so forth. So ultimately, you know, our message is uh, a reassuring one, a positive one. We can fix this stuff. But then, I mean, in rereading the report, I also thought that we had a discomforting message because we couldn't really put our finger on who should do this job, right? Who should be the fixers? Who should bring about repoliticization? Uh, because, of course, as Katz was saying, we started off with the populist. Uh, and I was thinking, so do we want to say that it's the populists who should bring forward this agenda of uh, institutional change? The mainstream parties, we, we discuss about them that uh, also uh, loss of touch, you know, with, with, with society at large. So I was really left wondering, okay, who are the political actors that should bring about change? And so when uh, Cass was now mentioning that the importance of uh, bringing ideology back in. <laughs> I think it's it's crucial and it speaks exactly uh, to this second thought I was having about our report that whoever the actors are, they need to have, uh, I don't know if it's ideology, but a very strong positioning. Okay, what needs to be done? And this should really inform uh, political debate. Uh, so, what Cass was saying really struck me because as I was saying, I think that um, 
the discomforting message in our report, at least thus far, is that, that we didn't discuss Yes, but who are the actors that will bring about this repoliticization agenda in place? Um, and I think that for the moment I will stop here. Okay, so now it feels like the strongest critique so far of our paper is coming from one of the co-authors of, uh, of the paper. Um, <laughs> I think Quinn um, uh, wanted to come in as well. Do you have uh, some more critique of her own work? Actually, I do. <laughs> um, so I, I really appreciated Cass's framing, and especially the sort of differential ranking of the terms that we should be thinking about and we should be most concerned about, sort of downgrading of populism as such and upgrading of problems of democratic <clears throat> deficits and so on. I also agree with him about the, the, the instructive role that the United States can play in a way here. I mean, as, an, as someone who lives in America, I'm Canadian, but exposed to American politics, sometimes it feels like the way that sort of wokeness and race politics and gender politics get put over here and economic politics get over here couldn't be any worse. But then all one has to do is spend any time in the political environment of the UK or continental Europe, you realize, oh, in fact, it can get worse. And the way that those are kept completely siloed from one another and played off against each other as opposites is actually shocking in the, even in the, in, in the intelligent commentary in a place like Germany or Britain so I think that you know the moment that we've been given here uh, since 2016 is, as Kass put it well, I think you know, listen to the questions that populists are asking, when then provide different answers and new answers. And I think that that's simply to sort of reemphasize something that he was saying. That I think that breaking down that gap by showing that these so-called identity politics always include, by definition, economic consequences is. An essential first step, and I think that's that's what we were trying to do in the way that we were framing the problem. Where I'll um, where I'll say that I think he sort of let us off the hook a little bit is the timing of this paper, right? That between the time that we wrote this and the time it appeared, something rather large happened in the world of sort of monetary policy with inflation, and I think that there is a kind of way that we give ourselves a lot of leash in this in this paper by saying all it is is a matter of sort of wading into the public sphere and deciding how this like large and growing potential pie of social spending can be divided up differently to this new um, pressure that's being put on governments to act in their sense uh, with the politics of responsibility rather than responsiveness to the point that even kind of left liberal pundits like Adam Tooze is sort of finds himself you know amazingly sort of without words or without proposals for how this Gordian knot can kind of be cut. So I would say that maybe that's something for discussion, which is how does the politics of inflation now sort of further um, constrain us and, and sort of reinforce the very tendency that we're trying to criticize in the paper? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. And yeah, you're right to point out that we kind of tagged a few lines on at the end about that, um, but that was definitely a sort of a timing issue there. Um, yeah, um, before we go back to Max and, uh, oh, sorry, to back to Kass, and then uh, after that, um, dive into the q and I think, Max, uh, you wanted to say a few words as well. Yeah, um, let me add my thanks to, to Kass for, for those brilliant comments, and then um, I'll try to make two points very quickly so we have enough time for, for responses in Q&A. One on Tina not cutting it, and that links to Quinn's point. And then another one about what bringing back ideology could mean or what, what kind of obstacle that would have to overcome. The first one on Tina not cutting it, um, I think it's easy to forget that kind of the original iteration of Tina in the late 70s, early 80s was the outcome of a brutal decade of intense political contestation where in a way everything else was tried. You know, the, the UK ends up uh, begging the, the IMF for a bailout and, and Mitterrand turns around in 81, 82, 83, really having tried almost everything else. And, and, you know, in the US, you have kind of pretty direct intervention in the energy sector under Nixon, and that ends up in pretty violent trucker strikes. So, so I think saying that Tina didn't cut it, it really, there's a big difference between, between a kind of 
context where you do have low inflation, low interest rates, plenty of spare capacity, and then a kind of 1970s or possibly contemporary moment where, where you really are at the outer limits of what's possible. And then you know, politics is it's just something qualitatively different. So I just wanted to kind of gently push back on that. Um, and then link to this, the, the, the um, challenge for bringing back ideology, uh, re ideologize yeah, I'm not going to say it, bring back ideology into the debate, I think is really, uh, again, probably the, the Mitterrand moment, the, the early 80s, um, because there, there was probably the last time that a, a G7 government, democratically elected, really tried to say, look, we're not going to follow market pressure, we're really going to, to move in another direction, and in a way got punched in the face by, by currency markets, and then decided, okay, given this reaction, our best bet is going to be the kind of the Europeanization of, of social democratic Keynesianism. Now, of course, we, we are now at kind of at the end of, the, of that particular road. And so I think the, the, the a productive question to ask in order to generate a new ideology that you could bring into, into the public debate is, you know, what can we learn from this early 80s moment? What has changed in the world since then? What have we learned since then? And, and what would a different response look like today? Well, that uh, makes everything even more complicated. Thank you, Max. Uh... As usual, um, I'll, um, I guess I'll throw it back to uh, to Cass uh, if you want to say a few words, and then we can uh, dive into um, into the Q and A. I have to kind of explain how I see the world. I mean, first of all, I don't understand economics much, um, and I don't really look at things from policy perspective. Like, so I'm kind of a vulgar Gramscian in the sense that I believe that everything is ideological and I believe that you need like ideological hegemony to, to achieve political hegemony. And I think the big mistake, and I'm very clearly a social democrat and, and like concerned with, with bringing social democracy back <clears throat> in the real form and not in the, in the sense of party success. And so m my position on this, uh, on kind of this neoliberal moment, right? Is that I don't necessarily think that neoliberalism as an economic model um, has been as successful as, as many left-wing people argue. I think in that I, I agree with, with Roderick, the state is still very strong. To yeah. me, um, the, the, the real strength of neoliberalism is as an ideology. <clears throat> um, and so I mean, Wolfgang Streeck writes, writes about that, one of the few actually that I saw really write about how, how dominant it has been. And I believe as an ideology, neoliberalism has become largely hegemonic. And of course, when an ideology becomes hegemonic, it no longer is seen as an ideology, right? It's because it, it, it now becomes a rational argument. And so when I talk about bringing ideology back to a certain extent is also by just acknowledging that our current our current thinking about a lot of things is ideological um and 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 we don't right and, and so for example when you talk about inflation almost everyone has the same idea about what inflation is not in in uh, in an objective sense, but in normative sense right and that and that is based on a certain interpretation of economy. My interest is not even so much about whether it is or not is not wrong. It's the same with Tina. For me, for me, Tina is not about the policy. For me, Tina is about not having an ideological argument for your policy. Right? And so Brexit was the best example of that. Brexit <clears throat> had no ideological argument, fundamental ideological argument, why staying in the EU was, was the best option. Right? It, it, it had policy arguments and it had mostly teen arguments and, and ridiculous arguments about third world wars, right? And we see that very often, right? When there is a crisis, there, there are like three responses. One is like, if we don't do anything, it's World War Three, right? The other one is we just have to do what by and large the markets want. And then the third one is a nationalist one. Um, and. So my point is, to a large extent, I think a lot of policies could, sh should probably stay, but they should be explained. I think a lot of, a lot of the, the dissatisfaction is based on the lack of explanation of why we have the policies that we have. 
um, and <clears throat> populists, for the sake of argument, empower people. Because up against the Tina argument, right, they say we actually can do it. Right? And the point is, they're right. You can do it. It might not be worth it, right? But Brexit has shown that. Like, I mean, Brexit has shown that you can get out of the EU, which for decades was argued was impossible, right? Now, the response to that should not have been Third World War or whatever, right? It should have been why you should stay in the EU and why these few points that are perhaps less popular are compensated by all these other points, like in the world you try to create. And so I think I think that is that is so fundamental. Like, sure, I think that there that there are a lot of policies that have to be changed, but I also actually think that there are a lot of policies that cannot be changed fundamentally. <clears throat> and that the ideals that we're discussing at the moment are just not feasible because the costs are too big. Right? I mean, think about closed borders, right? Which is obviously completely impossible. But if you would actually explain like what the human cost, let alone economic cost, but the human cost of closed borders are, right? And I'm pretty certain that the vast majority of Europeans are not willing to pay that price, right? Um, <clears throat> and I, I think, uh, again, like for me, that is about, there are two aspects about bringing back ideology. First of all, ideologies need to be updated. Like they, they were created in a very different world for a very different society with very different values. This even uh, applies to something like uh, social democracy, which is pretty much grounded like in patriarchy. It's grounded in heteronormativity. And I would even argue it's grounded in white supremacy. <clears throat> now, not at an ideological level, but if you want to make a social democracy for the 21st century, you, you can't just bring like that system now and say, look, new labor was all bad. We go back to before that. No, there were fundamental issues in that. That's one element, right? We just have to have updated ideologies. The other one is to have ideologically informed debates, right? And, and <clears throat> policies are secondary there. Again, I think it is much more important that people understand why politicians do things right, than simply what they do. I see we're already almost running out of time, um, but um, I'll very quickly uh, throw it to Lee and then I want to ask a few questions because I think a few of the questions have been are really potentially enlightening in terms of what we're talking about. But first, uh, very quickly, Lee. Yes, yeah, sorry. No, I just wanted to jump in and connect briefly the points that Cash just made and Quinn was asking about inflation, just because I think uh, the point about ideology uh, is really illuminating there because, you know, perhaps not full ideology, but if you just think about the way that we define inflation in economics, right, is it's as a general rise in prices, right? So all prices go up. That's how we define inflation in the models. And that's how we think about it from a perspective of policy, right? That's why we tend to think that central banks need to raise interest rates because the point is to squash prices all across the economy. But if you think about the way that people experience inflation, it's not as a general rise in prices. If it was a completely general rise in prices, it wouldn't be painful, right? Because our wages would be rising at exactly the same level as prices. And, you know, all that would be changing would be the sticker on the on the tag that you're buying at the grocery store. So what's actually painful is a relative rise in prices when the prices at the grocery store and the fuel pump go up, but your wages don't go up and you can afford less. And so if we start looking at inflation in that way, then how we react to it could be completely different, right? And so we could start looking at sectoral policies, right? Like how do you address prices rising in particular sectors? How do you um, support people who are suffering more because their wages aren't rising as fast as others, et cetera? And so I, I'm not gonna like lay out policies here, but my point is, is that Cass's point that the way that we define things and look at things through a particular lens has massive implications for our policies. And so I think, you know, 
to Quinn's point, inflation is the perfect thing for us to be thinking about with this report, right? Because it's like, what does it look like to repoliticize monetary policy and addressing inflation in this context is a really difficult question because it's scary because most economists will tell you there's only one answer, right? There is only one alternative and that's raising interest rates. But if you start digging down into how we're defining things, that starts to change a bit. And so maybe we can repoliticize a little bit more. Yeah, I think we also mentioned somewhere in the report uh, the the dangers of talking about repoliticization of uh, monetary policy because a lot of people will get very scared that uh, going to turn turn into Germany in the in the early nineteen twenties. Um, I personally don't agree with that, uh, but I think that's a, a definitely a debate we should have some other time and continue with that. I think if I if I look at the the questions that people are asking, one of the uh, things that keeps coming up uh, that a few people have mentioned is around um, actually something that I feel like we've slightly moved away from in the discussion, which is the point of repoliticization, um, and so sort of now that we've slightly moved towards re ideologization, um, that. I don't think that point is moved, but, but a few people have asked basically about sort of what that would look like exactly, sort of a repoliticization. Um, and um, oh God, then we're already talking about the hyperinflation. I've seen the chat now as well. Um, and so I wonder if if anybody would like to come in on that, and particularly sort of the relationship between um, the democratic institutions and these sort of technocratic institutions that 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 we do talk a bit. Um, or actually quite a lot about, and I'm, I'm wondering whether anybody has any views on sort of how that relationship would change when you are talking about re-ideologization. If I just say it enough, I'll, at one point I'll be able to do it. Uh, Max, uh, did you want to say something on that? Yeah, just a quick thought on that, and um, that also links it to the role of technocracy. Um, I think one element of neoliberalism that, that Cass really highlighted nicely is its power as an ideology, and specifically its power to make certain policies that are in the interest of some appear in the interest of all and you know classic kind of tina in the 1990s um and so i think a big part of bringing back ideology would be to articulate genuinely different visions of how a society could be structured of how an economy could be run how a central bank could be run that say that that don't say look this is always going to be in the interest of all but that say look this will be in the interest of for example the many and not the few to pick a random one but to really articulate the existence of conflict and different ways of resolving that conflict. If you think of it that way, then the role of a technocracy and let's say specifically government, public administration ministries and, and the central bank would be to implement the particular vision of structuring the economy that prevails in, in democratic uh, contest. And so it's still important, but you know, following a, a previous phase and that takes the important decision. That's very clear, Quinn. Yeah, I think uh, noticing some of the questions in the chat, um, there's, I think, legitimate questions about, for example, what would this mean that civil servants would be political appointees? Um, we've raised the question of whether central banks would retain their independence. I think those are fair questions, but I think our point in this paper was more to put a spotlight on the existence of a kind of a problem of depoliticization and technocracy within the European Union in particular, and try to make that make it possible to discuss that without that immediately being taken in a knee-jerk way as a kind of an attempt to hamstring the, the European project or an attempt to sort of side with the populace, right? So it's the beginning, it's it's not the answer, it's, it's to follow Cass's lovely framing, it's not an answer to questions, but it's a new way of answering a different kind of question, which is, you know, what is the problem here that we have thus far been sort of unable to see because of the way that we've decided these discussions have to go, that either one signs on to sort of centralized control from Brussels or one has now sided with the rebels of the dissident populist movement. If you accept that there's a space between in which parts of the European project have been hampered in their own terms by their own institutional um, establishment, then you can perhaps start to address these these more technical questions of what one actually then means once you've accepted that depoliticization may indeed be a problem. Uh, Hans, uh, did you want to come in on that as well uh, before I go back to Cass? Yeah, and exactly on this, and, and I wanted to basically ask a question to Cass. So this is perfect. Um, so, you know, it, it does seem to me that there is a difference between Tina, say, in the case of 
Britain in the 1980s, when you have a hegemonic ideology that then, as we've just been describing, you know, comes to seem natural and, and not ideological or political um, because it's hegemonic. That on the one hand, and then what you have in the EU, which it does seem to me is somehow different, which is where you actually take economic policy out of the space of democratic contestation. Um, and, and so, you know, even if the hegemonic ideology um, changes, um, you'd have to have, seem, this is kind of part of the argument we were making in that section of the paper, was you'd have to have such a consensus around it within the EU, which is quite difficult to change it, because now we've created these rules in perpetuity. Um, you know, for example, the fiscal rules, how difficult it is to change those. But that seems to me is a slightly different kind of problem than, you know, a country that has just, you know, followed a neoliberal ideology um, uh, in the way that the UK did, you know, from the 1980s onwards. And the flip side of that, um, it seems to me, is that so, you know, I'm absolutely convinced that that, you know, overall repoliticization would would be a good thing from a democratic perspective. But with the EU, I do also find myself ask I find myself asking myself, well, actually, could the EU survive that? Right? Because depoliticization, it seems to me, is so fundamental to the European project from the beginning. And the way I often phrase it is it's part of the genius of the European project, actually, is to depoliticize, you know, starting with coal and steel, right? And you know, make war between France and, and Germany impossible. That has then gone much, much further, you know, particularly with the creation of the euro and so on. But it does seem to me um, at least a possibility that if you repoliticize within the EU, that you then have some conflicts that are quite difficult to manage. And precisely because, you know, and this is again Peter Mayer, Cass, you know, this problem of opposition in the EU, right? So that I think in the EU, it wouldn't necessarily look like a left-right ideological competition. It, you know, what we have is, you know, this mixture of sort of, you know, national interests and then pro-Europeans versus Eurosceptics, right? So a more political EU in the EU is not necessarily a, a sort of a healthy left-right competition. Um, and so, yes, I find myself wondering what that might look like in, in the slightly different case of the EU. Well, that's a great question, because um, uh, would our suggestions mean the end of the European Union? Uh... So, so let me, I, it's far from me to speak for what, what you guys were writing, but when I read about uh, repolitization, Right, I thought a response that this was a response to the privatization of certain sectors, of the deregulation of certain sectors, of the creation of expert bodies, like independent expert bodies outside of political control, right? And and I think you can do all those things without undermining the EU, right? Um, and I think they're crucial. And I think actually one of the examples I always use. As, as an example of, of where, we get, where we get really democratic um, dissatisfaction from is actually the privatization of public transport, which like has isolated both in reality as well as in the feeling, like whole populations. And there's some research that shows that like the longer it takes you to get to the central city of your country, like the, the, the higher the propensity to vote for populist parties. Um, again, like <clears throat> the public transport is not is 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 a fundamental aspect. It's actually an economic aspect to that as well. The US is even clearer, right? But but it's the same in Europe. Like if you don't have train or bus connections anymore to the metropolitan area, then a lot of jobs are no longer open to you, right? <clears throat> and so, I think I think for for me, a lot of the the repolitization is is about that. Like it, you have given that power over those things away. You can take it back, and this goes to the Tina point of the EU. Yes, the EU provides. I first of all, I think the debate about how what politics means within the EU structure. I don't think it's problematic that that is potentially different than what it means in the national uh, arena, right? That, that politics within the EU doesn't have exactly the same scope <clears throat> or issues uh, as in the national. I think that that is not necessarily a problem. I think that a lot of this TINA 
in the sense that we have to do this because we're part of the EU, right? This is the same like we, we can't reinstate the death penalty because we're going to be kicked out of the Council of Europe, things like that. The point is that you can, like you can actually reintroduce the death penalty, but for most people, it won't be worth like the price you have to pay for that. And that's the same, like, again, my point is not so much that we should fundamentally change all policies. In many cases, you compromise and we do stuff that at the national level is not ideal, but the price is giving up all other type of things. I think about, for example, um, accepting EU rule as, as being above like national law, right? Now, there are various occasions, like in every country, that you think like, eh, like this goes actually against core values of us. But if we would, if we would go against that, we would undermine it in all contexts, right? And and then we have no argument anymore against Poland or or Hungary doing that. And so, for me, that structure a we have created and we can reshape, and and b overall most people, at least in the elite, seem to think that that structure is worth it. And I have to be honest, I'm a Eurosceptic, right? And I actually was anti-EU until Brexit. I still have a major issue with the EU being there, but I kind of have accepted that it is there. If I would have the utopian choice of doing everything all over again, I would take it. But the EU is, is as it is, right? Um, but it is far from perfect particularly from a social democratic point of view. But social democratic parties come up with all kinds of policies at the national level and never think, or at least never say out loud, what that would require at the European level, right? And this strict separation, again, this is exactly what Peter talked about. Like a national policy should be decided at the european uh, level. Um, that is a that is a massive a massive issue, right? And so again, I think yes, we should reform the structure of the EU, not to eat. We shouldn't do away with the EU. At the same time, at times we have to accept things that are suboptimal from the EU because overall, having the structure of the EU is positive. But you have to explain that, right? And that requires ideology. That's very very interesting. Also, because I think it slightly links to one of the questions that we that we got in the in the Q&A that might be sort of a bit too sort of institutional or technical. Um, I wonder whether anybody has any views on that, um, which is uh, basically the, the very simple question of what's the role for the European Parliament in our kind of thinking. And I remember when we were sort of working particularly on the sort of the conclusions and, and the suggestions um, uh, for the paper, sort of one of the conclusions that you could draw from it, particularly from uh, from the uh, sort of the constraints put on national democratic politics by uh, by the EU um, in some ways is well just move your politics to the European level and just create a European democracy. So what um, and then have that sort of function in a properly ideal ideologized way. Um, so I wonder whether anybody um, uh, would want to come on uh, come in on that and say anything about that. Or do we not want to speak up for the European Parliament here? Let's see. Oh, uh, oh, I think Manuela wants to. Uh, uh, yeah, I think I uh, I want to reiterate the point that Queen also made before me. Um, I think that I mean we haven't entered really the detail, right, of how exactly to repoliticize, of how exactly should be the details of how to do that, uh, how to empower, you know, different the people or different institutions, really the idea was here to set uh, an agenda, set a point that we think that uh, depoliticization as we have conceived it thus far uh, is problematic. Uh, and uh, it's, it's exactly the, uh, just about time to start rethinking about that. Um, and I'm sure that as we go ahead, uh, I don't know if we will have a follow-up report, but for sure we then need to discuss much more what we think about the European Parliament and all the other uh, important institutions uh, that uh, belong to the European landscape. Uh, but uh, to our audience, uh, to say the truth, I think that we didn't enter into this uh, type of uh, important uh, technical debate. For us, it was really more important uh, to set the broad research agenda. So 
think about it as a kind of manifesto of the things that uh, we thought that needs to be done or to reflect upon. Yes, yeah, so the, the traditional, we need to do a lot more work, uh, unfortunately, which, uh, I, yeah, we're definitely going to try to do um, uh, at Chatham House, uh, where we continue to work on these issues. So we have um, reached uh, the end of our hour. Um, so I am going to um, say massive thanks to uh, first to Cus for for joining us and for his um, for his insights. It's been uh, fascinating um, uh, to hear your thoughts and uh, yeah, I think um, that has definitely helped us uh, move a bit forward um, with uh, with the next phase of our work as well. Um, and um, yeah, massive thanks to all my co-authors for joining us and to all the uh, everyone in the audience as well. I'm very sorry that I didn't get to all of your questions, but the uh, conversation just kept flowing and it felt a bit like um, some of the sessions that we had in preparation of the report where we brought um, some groups of experts together uh, for discussions around these kinds of topics. And I felt like I was back in one of those, which uh, I very much mean as a compliment to everyone on the call um, because those were incredibly insightful. Um, yeah, so as I said, we're gonna continue the work on these uh, these issues. Um, one of the things that we've touched a bit uh, upon, but not all that much is um, the topic of uh, particularly central bank independence which is something that we talk a bit about in the paper, um, but left slightly out of the discussion today. I think it's a really interesting one, particularly given the times that we are in now um, uh, with, uh, with inflation being so high. Um, so we're gonna try to have a follow-up discussion on that uh, sometime soon. And with that, um, I am going to wish everyone a very nice evening or afternoon, depending on where they're based. And uh, a final thank you for joining us. <laughs>